Hey, how's it going everybody? It's your boy and today's video is going to be something a little bit different. A little bit of a recommendations video for people who are interested in knowing what I've been reading over the past couple of months and what I recommend. So what better way than to do it now when I haven't got much time and I need to make a video for the week because the algorithm's going to forget me if I don't make a video. Please don't forget me, YouTube. So, okay, uh, there's not going to be any particular order in which these books, which I'm going to be recommending, will go in. It's not in order of what's best, where to start first. It's purely just, we're winging it, guys, okay? I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. First up, Revolt of the Masses by Jose Ortega y Gasset. Now, this book is one of my prime influences over the past couple of years. Ever since I found it last decade, like... I can't stop thinking about it every so often. Like, there's just something about his thesis and how he views the world which seems to resonate more so with our day and age than it did way back in the 1920s, 1930s when he wrote this, and also compared to a lot of his contemporaries like Spengler. This is one of the many authors that I recommend if you want to get a different approach to the decline and fall of the West, how we got to where we are. So... He actually even talks about Spengler in the in the book and discusses about whether or not the West, you know, Western civilization is actually in decline or not. And his opinion was at that very moment, no, but that doesn't mean that it won't or anything like that. But that's not the general idea of this book. That's only one of many threads. The main thread, however, is, well, what the title's about. The masses, how they revolted. What was this revolt? Well, to simplify this really badly essentially jose believes that at some point in the 19th century there was a change in the way humans uh, basically organized ourselves it used to be that the best would always rise to the top or at least were allowed to rule uh, these were the exceptional people again you know that doesn't mean that they're necessarily great at their jobs but compared to the masses they're a little bit a cut of a above you know however something changed and that was mainly to do with i guess the ideologies of the french revolution and what came out of that uh, the masses decided you know what why not we can do it what could possibly happen and this resulted in yet more uh, let's just say collectivist ideologies becoming popular in the 19th and 20th centuries like communism fascism take your pick and in his opinion this created a new form of man uh, the mass man. You may have heard me use this term before. You'll have heard other people use this term, but they don't know where it comes from. As far as I'm aware, this is the book that coins that term. And as far as I'm aware, he has a very different view and idea of what the mass man actually is. Usually when people use that term, if they know about it, they use it in the way that masses is always used, the unwashed masses, the working classes. However, Jose doesn't think that that is necessarily the case. You can be any class, any distinction, anything, and still be a mass man. A mass man is a state of mind, really. You are the mass. You are the average person. And with that comes, well, the things that come along with being the average Joe. You're more collectivist. Uh, you're suspicious of change. You're suspicious of anything that's different. And you react violently to such things. That's what he thinks. And in many ways, I think he borrowed that from Nietzsche and his idea of the herd. I think it's a very similar idea. And he's just took it to its logical conclusion, in my opinion. That is what a mass man is. And when these people take control, well, the end result is the destruction of liberty because these people don't know any better because their idea of liberty is everybody being in harmony, being the same, singing Kumbaya when... Obviously, that's not what liberty is. That's totalitarianism. Highly recommend this book. I really urge you people to read this book because it's just something different. It's a different point of view. It's not in opposition to the likes of Spengler and the like. Just read it as somebody who has a different spin on it and you might actually end up coming to different conclusions than you otherwise would. Next is uh, the unsung hero of Ankapistan and that is uh, David Friedman and his book the Machinery of Freedom. Now, this is a book that's... It's not unknown. It's not unheard of. It's just ignored by a lot of ANCAPs because, well, they're Rothbardians. And because they're Rothbardians, they're Austrians, and they're not familiar with the Chicago School, and if they are, they're in loggerheads with it, or they just don't understand it. And they don't realise that there's a whole other school of ANCAPs led by David Friedman and also his son, and they've 
basically come to the idea that Rothbard came to from a different place. In fact, these books came out at, at the exact same time because Rothbard had his uh, Foreign Liberty, I think, and that was 1973, just like the Machine of Freedom, which also came out in 1973. And these are the two schools of Ankapistan. But when people think of anarcho-capitalism, they think of Rothbard, they think of Hopper, but they never think of Friedman and the Friedmanites. When you read this book, you realise that straight away he's coming from a completely different point of view, but comes to the same conclusion that the state is bad and that anarcho-capitalism is the way forward. Only David Friedman is not as bombastic, he's not as... Well, he is radical, but in his language he is not as radical as Rothbard is. Rothbard, when you read him, you get a sense that the man is, (laughs) let's just say, overly passionate Whereas David Friedman is, well, because he's a, a natural intellectual in the autistic sense of the word, he kind of just analyses everything with a fine tooth comb and cuts it apart. I would also like to add that the central difference between Rothbard and Friedman is that David Friedman is a consequentialist. No, he's not a utilitarian like John Stuart Mill or Bentham. He's a rule utilitarian, which means that laws, things like that, should be based on the consequences of those actions. Uh, Should we have this law, and if so, what would be the consequences of said action? And it's this consequentialist space that really separates him from Rothbard. I just thought I would uh, add that before going back to the rest of the video. Thank you very much. And also, he manages to do a very good little thought experiment where there's no morals, no nothing. How does two people come together to work out boundaries and stuff like that? And it works. David Friedman may offer you if you're thinking about getting into anarcho-capitalism but something about Rothbard or Hopper irks you maybe David Friedman is the man who might convince you and this could be the path you go down now this book may uh may surprise a few people some of you may not even have heard about this this is the myth of natural rights by L.A. Rollins who was L.A. Rollins he was a satanist which uh some people may have alarm bells but this is the church of satan this is a libertarian sect. This is not an actual religion. They don't actually believe in Satan. They are egoists. Uh, It's just a different way of living your life, I guess. He is a Levian Satanist, obviously, but not all Satanists necessarily agree with this book, just so you guys know. But that shouldn't stop you from reading this book, because it doesn't stop a lot of you from watching my dear friend Jim Jesus, who's also one. So what is this book about? Well, it's about, obviously, the myth of natural rights. As some of you know, I don't really believe they're a thing. That doesn't mean that we can't have rights and that the idea of these natural rights, well, depending on what you think a natural right is, which is part of the problem, uh, some of them, like free speech, uh, freedom of association, all the good libertarian so-called natural rights, yeah, good. The idea of them is fine, and you should, if you want to live in society like that, have those rights. But that doesn't mean they're natural. Because what makes them natural? Technically speaking, and this is in the book from another... This is actually a collection of essays, not just by L.A. Rollins, but from other people, including Rathbad, who we mentioned before, and somebody who was defending him. This created one of the many libertarian civil wars, although it's one that's not well known. So the essential argument is that it doesn't exist, and that the people who put forward this argument are really religious they're they're coming from a religious point of view even when they're meant to be atheists they have no evidence of this and not only that it seems to Ellie Rollins that it contradicts their ideology when they're trying to come up with these ideas and these explanations for their ideas and justifying them it doesn't make sense to him if anything it it doesn't help at all. And that the idea of natural rights seems to be different to different people. I mean, it's different to the Catholics, it's different to the Libertarians, it's different to Muslims, it's different to literally everybody you can possibly imagine. He even says that Hitler believed in natural rights, which he did. In one of his many speeches, or in Mein Kampf it might have been, he says that National Socialism is abiding by natural law, or at least his version of it. Now, is this the same natural law that Rothbard believes in? That uh, Stephen Conkin the third believes in? Uh, they would disagree. They would say he didn't believe in natural law, but he says that he did. You see what I mean? I recommend it because it's something different for a lot of you who do believe in natural rights. I think that's most of my audience. You should read this, and then maybe after that you could get into the likes of Stirner, 
And you can also read uh, another essay that became a book, which is available online, called uh, Natural Rights or Never Put a, a Rubber on Your Willy, uh, by another anarchist writer, another libertarian anarchist writer, who defended this book. That one is a funnier read. This one is more of a brutal read. I mean, it's only about 70 pages. You'll finish it in, a, in like an evening. Now, this is a very interesting book that I've saved to last. And this is for those of you who, like me, are history nerds and you're into late antiquity or the fall of Rome slash the Dark Ages, and you want to know what life was like back then, and you're looking for something that's different from the usual, because there are two main schools of thought before I introduce this book. There is the school of thought that believes there was a decline and fall of Rome, which was then succeeded by these barbarian successor states, and also Byzantium, and then later on uh, the Muslim kingdoms that came in to conquer it, and this ended up in, a set, except for the Byzantines and the Arabs, it ended up in a situation where Europe was thrown into a Dark Ages before it ended up in the Middle Ages, which ended up going into the Renaissance, where there was a collapse in learning, in infrastructure, technology, everything collapsed, everything went worse, whereas before, the standard of living was better, education was better, technology was improving at an exponential rate, philosophy was at an all-time high, with the likes of Plato, Aristotle, influencing other philosophers like Marcus Aurelius, you know, the Stoics or the Epicureans, etc., etc. All that ended with Rome. Now, the other school of thought is that it wasn't really, really a decline and fall. Yes, the Roman Empire fell, quote-unquote, but this was really more of a transitionary period. It was the empire decentralising and changing into something different because it couldn't, at least the Western side of it at least, just couldn't function in its usual state. And this created the Barbarian Kingdoms, which would later become England, France, Germany, etc. And this was a necessary step towards our current civilization, or at least the high point of it anyway, and that it shouldn't be seen as such a bad thing. But yet that second narrative doesn't explain why things went to shit nonetheless. And this guy, who was writing in the 1910s to about the 1930s, Henri Piren, wrote this book, which he never finished, unfortunately, though judging by how big the paperback version is, uh, it was quite a big undertaking. And this is Mohammed and Charlemagne, or Mah Mohammed et Charlemagne, or however you pronounce it in French. I don't know English. This book was written in the 30s, and in many ways, it's kind of a transitionary work. It's similar to the likes of Gibbon, who said there was a decline and fall and Christianity caused it, on, among, amongst other issues. But then also kind of like the Peter Heather school, who said that late antiquity really wasn't that bad. He's kind of in the middle. He doesn't think it was that bad. In fact, in his argument, Rome declined and fell, well, at least the western part of it anyway, and the successor kingdoms took over. However, things didn't go immediately to shit. Yes, there was a, a, a marked decline, but there was a recovery process, and... In the first 100 years, they were beginning to synthesise with the Germanic tribes, the Romans, that is. And there was a transformation in continental Europe, which was then bleeding into England, because remember, England was the one country that really transformed due to these barbarian invasions compared to the others. Slowly but surely, things were getting back on track, and something new was being created. Unfortunately, Mohammed happened. Yes, Mohammed the founder of Islam, although of course not him himself, but his successors that created the Caliphate. Although it's not just the Caliphate, he also blames the Byzantines with their reconquest of North Africa and then especially later on Italy for really damaging uh, the recovery process that had happened during the preceding 100 to 200 years. But his central thesis is that the rise of Islam created the Dark Ages for Europe, and his reason is that they attacked Europe, and especially the Byzantines, during a time of weakness. Uh, the Justinian Plague had just happened in the Byzantine Empire, let alone the warfare that was going on in Italy and other places. And in fact, in Spain, there'd even been some demilitarization going on with the Visigoths, and this resulted in widespread destruction initially, because, well, it was a massive conquest. Almost the whole of Spain was conquered, parts of southern France fell temporarily, Sicily fell, parts of southern Italy had fallen also, 
And what did this result in? Well, it resulted in the Europeans under Charlemagne and Charles Martel before him becoming more insular, a, a more uh, defensive. Uh, sea trade stopped because, in his opinion, uh, the Arabic pirates made it almost impossible for European traders to trade with the Byzantines via sea, which meant that a lot of the books and scrolls and information that was also being traded, and not just goods and services, stopped. In fact, he, he claims in the book and has sources that see, say that sea trading pretty much collapsed completely, at least between Europe and the Byzantines and the Arabs. Now, obviously, eventually this would change and things would become less insular, but his theory is that that is what happened, which is controversial to say the least, but it does offer us an explanation as to how things really went to shit. Now, there is a book out there, which I can't remember. I think it's Mohammed and Charlemagne Revisited, where this guy, I think he's an historian, although there's not much about him online, decides to see if Henri Piren is correct. And apparently a lot of modern evidence that we've found over the past, well, nearly 100 years has pointed towards him possibly being right in a lot of cases. So if you're interested in something different, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is a revisionist history, because bear in mind the era of late antiquity, the Dark Ages, the early Middle Ages, is kind of shrouded in a lot of mystery. We don't have a lot of sources from this period. This is a different idea. This is a different hypothesis as to what could have happened, and I do recommend it because I think it makes a lot of sense as to why initially, in continental Europe at least, things weren't that bad, but then went really bad. So there you have it, guys. I think I'll end it there. There's four books that you guys ought to read that are just a little bit different to what you would usually be recommended to read on a YouTube channel such as mine. I hope you have a lot of fun with it. Highly recommend this one in particular for the history nerds. And uh, until next time, it's been your boy, and I'll see you all later.